And if anybody is worried that their life's work will be stolen by making it accessible to the broader scientific community, they really ne need to get some self-confidence. Ironically, a lot of those that are hoarding their data were funded by taxpayer money. There is that also. Okay, so digital accessible knowledge. A lot of data exists for a lot of taxa around the world. As you know, a lot of those data are in non-digital formats, non-shared digital formats, or poorly developed shared digital formats. And again, if the data aren't digital and accessible, they don't exist. So let's look at where we lose digital accessible knowledge. In some sense, out there is all of biodiversity. Might be five million species, might be 50 million species. Nobody really knows. And a big piece of biodiversity has not been sampled. So right away, the part of biodiversity that's been sampled is a tiny subset. In space, in time, in environment, and in taxa. Okay, we've already lost almost everything because it hasn't been sampled. Now, from what's been sampled, some of those observational data, some of those specimen data, have been lost. Of the ones that still exist, some of them are sitting there unidentified. Every single scientific collection in the world has a hold-up cabinet or has a problems cabinet. In some cases, it's a few birds or a few plants, and in other cases, it's thousands. So cer certainly determination, and good, solid determination at that, is one of our leaks. Obviously digitization, and that's gonna be a really critical factor around this table. Okay, some of your countries have natural history museums and herbaria, and some of those have done good work in getting moving in digitization. A lot of countries will find that most of the existing biodiversity knowledge for their countries is not in their country, but rather is sitting somewhere in Europe or North America. Some of those data are available, digital and accessible, and some of them aren't. So certainly that's one of the big problems. Another problem is the garbage factor. Sometimes these data are so dirty that we can't even use them. And after break, I'm gonna show you an example from Kenya. The next step is georeferencing. Good, quantitative, detailed georeferencing with full characterization of precision and known sources of error. Then the data need to be published, shared. I don't mean like published as a scientific paper. I mean published in a web sense, made available to the whole community, to everybody. They need to be published under proper standards so that they can be quickly and efficiently integrated with other data sets. You know, my being able to look at 85 million records of birds around the world was thanks to standards. When Adolfo and I we're working on the Mexican bird atlas, which I haven't talked about today. Um, there were no standards. And so literally, data set by data set, how many data sets was it? How many museums? That's a comment I want to do because we fight a lot and joke a lot. But I think we use the example of the Me atlas of Mexican birds because we started all this. I, I, I don't know of any other data set that has been used as much for several steps of the biodiversity informatics and stuff. Conabio has certainly we, replicated. We did, we did the dirty work first. Yeah. That is why yeah. we made available a lot of data. Right. Otherwise, we wait. Conabio certainly has tried to replicate the bird data set. But yeah, we were the first ones to wade through and, and um, essentially get to the point where you could say, yeah, we have a comprehensive data set, but there were no standards. And so Adolfo was fabulous with, with access, or he used to be before he became an administrator. 
<laughs> and so he would sit there, okay, here's the next data set. I need to map this field onto this field. I need to transform this this way. Some of them would take days, weeks, months. And it was miserable. Years to georeference. But essentially, these standards reduce years of work to minutes. Once you are willing to publish and adhere to standards, you can integrate your data more broadly. That's where those 85 million records came from. So that's essentially the whole string. You can imagine them in different order, and you can certainly add to the list. That's fine. But my point is, let's look at the leaks. This first one is kind of trivial. There's a lot of work to do. Okay? But then, all of these are sources of information loss. Okay? If this is the sum of knowledge that has existed at any point in time about your country, all of these red arrows represent opportunities for information loss. My guess is, this is really ballpark, but my guess is that if you really could see all of these leaks, it's not easy, you would be in your data sets that you have, at the end of the day, you'll probably be looking at about 15% of what's really out there, what got to here or here, okay? So if we're trying to improve biodiversity information and knowledge, one of the easiest things to do is to plug some of these leaks. Obviously, I'm very eager and many of you are very eager to go out and do the field work. But we may achieve bigger immediate gains by plugging digital accessible knowledge leaks. And by looking at the information that essentially flows through here, we can then do this new work more effectively because we can do it in the gaps, the true gaps. So remember my tantrum just a moment ago about you ignored my data set. For that, that place in the Amazon. Probably the botanists know that, oh yeah, that institution that town's not going to name has huge collections from that region. Okay? And so maybe they're going to at least ballpark avoiding those collections. But if, if at the end, oops, sorry, if at the end of this, the usable information is rather comprehensive, then that's where we have the opportunity to do the gap analysis and orient our future surveys. I'm not saying wait on the future surveys until we digitize all the data from your country. But I am saying that this work will be optimized as you consider this information. So there's a ton of efforts out there. Adolfo and I kind of first started participating in this informatics world in the North American Biodiversity Information Network, and we literally killed it. Not we particularly, but we, the group, killed it and morphed it into Herpnet, Ornus, Manus, and Fishnet. And then we've, we're in the process of killing those and morphing them into Vertnet. And GBIF is harvesting all the data out of VertNet, but VertNet gives you better data detail. Um, one of the solutions out there is essentially citizen science. This is a really interesting um, example, eBird. Um, this is to give you the example of that same northern cardinal. That's the data density. Uh, it's just a ridiculous number of records of cardinals because everybody sees them on the feeder and notes them because they're so bright red. Here's a, uh, an ant pitta that's rather rare, but this is a pretty good characterization of its distribution. And then, you know, here's a species where there's essentially nothing known about it, a finch in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. But you can do things like this, you know, my eBird, you can keep your your life list, your country list, your state list. I mean, people love this. It's a sport, okay? 
I had a student once who had a competition with like five friends. It was called the Berdident competition, like president. And what they would do is they would race on state lists in each calendar year. And when you won a state, you got all of the electoral votes in our presidential electoral system. So like New York and California are the big ones. And Alaska has, what, I think four electoral votes. So it was much better to win New York or California, Ohio, Illinois, than sparsely populated states. And every year, for years and years, they would do that. But they're generating data. Okay, so, so citizen scientists can be a, a massive asset, particularly as they are oriented and guided by the existing data as we were talking. And so just, sorry Adolfo, this is some taxon that has feathers in the 20th century in Mexico. And you can see a decent data density, but some big gaps. But if we look at what the citizen scientists have generated, it looks kind of like that. So there's a, there's a lot of information to be harvested. Um, forget about that. So again, we can go back to that picture of digital accessible knowledge leaks. And what we should really see is that all of those are opportunities. Okay, those are opportunities to magnify the amount of information that you have at hand. And then you go out in the field. This is a place that I worked in 2010 in the Gobi Desert. An old Soviet missile transport was how we moved around. Um, there were no roads. You drove two-thirds of the way across the country just on these, these tracks. Um, this was at a point when the trucks broke down for two full days. Um, but you got views like this, truly incredible. These were the only trees for probably a couple hundred kilometers. So uh, when you do that field work, you want to do it as effectively as possible. You want to guide it strategically rather than just going kind of willy-nilly. So for Africa, um, we can follow these examples of survey gaps. We know that large gaps exist. You're going to find when you start playing with your data, it's going to be birds. If you're lucky, plants, not much more. Um, geography, you know about the macro gaps, you're going to see the micro gaps, okay, the fine scale maps. And obviously there's a bias towards more modern records. And it's a question of both informatics and field work. Um, just to give you, this is for birds, um, just to give you an idea of how countries line up in terms of observational data, the top country in Africa is, this is on a log scale by the way, Madagascar. There you go, Dimby. Um, and in terms of specimens, Kenya, but this is digital accessible knowledge. Everything could move around if all of those specimens were digitized. So back to that picture. Um, simply the point that uh, this day is kind of designed as starting you guys down an exploration path. If you're interested in it, it's a it's a very useful contribution to make to essentially develop a status of knowledge report. Uh, might be for the best known taxa, taxon, or the best known several taxa. It's nothing that's challenging. It's essentially what do the digital accessible knowledge data look like, okay? So, Let's stop with that. Let's get some coffee or tea and maybe be back by 11.40. Okay?